Nineveh, which to remind all of you was the Assyrian capital. This is an artist's relief of Nineveh. And at one point in time, it was the world's largest city. Now for centuries, this city laid beneath mounds of sand and dirt until archeologists discovered what lied beneath those mounds. They had named one of those mounds Nabi Yunus, which means the prophet Jonah in historical sense. And that became one of the most sensational finds, archeologically speaking, of modern times. They found massive gates, ramparts and walls were unearthed. Palaces were discovered like the palace of, and library of Ashurnabapal right here, you can see, which included 22,000 cuneiform tablets like the obelisk that we also studied in our first sermon in the series. Fragments of prisms, all recording the conquests of Assyrian kings and leaders. Now, what we also find out, however, as Nahum predicted, they also unearthed many unburied skeletons, evidencing violent deaths and attesting to the final battle and siege of Nineveh that destroyed that city and ended an empire. So with the regional desert winds and all the blow and the huff and puff and the bluster, those mounds of earth began to form over these fallen walls and cities over centuries. And it probably began almost immediately and it provided a grave for those that were unburied. Now, I wonder, we've gotten to know Jonah fairly well, right? If Jonah could have seen the future and he would have known that Nineveh would inevitably fall and Assyria would inevitably fall. I wonder if he would behave and react differently than we're going to see today that he actually behaved because 40 years, also 40 years after the event that we're talking about today, this same nation would also conquer Israel. Make sense? So eventually Nineveh would fall, Assyria would fall, but not until after God used them to discipline and judge his people for their failure to share the grace that he had given them with the world. Now, the reconstituted walls and gates of Nineveh recently made global news. How many of you over the last couple of years heard in the news about the old Assyrian capital and some of the things that have occurred there lately? Okay, let, I, I'll fill you in real quick. ISIS, heard of them? They captured Mosul, Iraq, right, which essentially is adjacent and or it's, it's, it's pretty much on the same side as Nineveh. They captured that city in 2014, and then they began destroying shrines, some of them Christian, some of them Muslim. They destroyed shrine after shrine after shrine because what they said was that they allegedly distorted Islam, right? So they tore them down. They de destroyed them. There was a mosque in the city that was dedicated to the prophet Jonah, and it was destroyed by ISIS July of that same year. So after 2,700 years of existence, the destruction of this very part of the wall of Nineveh culminated many such attacks on historic monuments of that city. Now, I'm not going to camp out here, but it's apropos that ISIS has been in the news again recently, haven't they? Makes one ask, you know, what in the world is the world coming to, right? It's a dark and decrepit and, and a very scary place, death after senseless Death and, and as we study this, it, it just seems so God-inspired in some ways that these events would be going on in the same exact part of the world who was warring with each other all these thousands of years ago, and there's still the war going on today. You know what that says to me? Hatred can run very, very deep. Very, very deep. We pass our feuds on to our legacies. What if you were directly affected by the violence that maybe went on in Orlando or maybe that went on out in California or perhaps in Paris or Belgium? You know, like what if that was affecting one of your family members, one of your dearest loved ones? Can you imagine? Now, normally, you know, I don't, I don't ask for you to do things hypothetically like that, but there's a reason for my doing that today. Imagine how you would feel what emotions would boil up in you if you actually had to grieve loss directly in any or all of these events? Can you imagine? And then what if God sent you to Raqqa? What if he sent you to these people who have hated you and that you have hated and there's all this violence and all this death? 
And not only did he send you there, he told you to go and warn them of the judgment that he was going to put upon these people. Part of me wonders if our natural response wouldn't be, oh God, you're going to judge them? Fantastic. Where do I buy popcorn and how do I get a seat? And then let's take this a step further. What if the message was taken to these people that have hated you and that you've hated and they repented and were preserved and their judgment didn't come? How would that affect you? How would it affect your view of God? How would you like that? Because look at me just for a second. That is in essence what happened in Jonah's life. Now we've seen what a knucklehead he could be. We've seen how judgmental he was, how prejudiced he was, how hateful he was. But let's not forget that there was a lot of motivation behind that. If you look at it from human perspective, it transcends all cultures and it makes sense. Because he's lost people. He's lost people to this thing. But let me ask you this. We've talked about this in previous weeks, so I'm just going to ask you quickly and we'll move on. But what other hope for the world is there? Right? I've told y'all before that I'm to the place now to where nothing really shocks me anymore. There's some shocking things going on. I've been shocked by some things lately. And I'm emotional about it. It affects me. It makes me angry. It does. But then I sit back and I think, okay, God, God if, you don't, if you don't solve this, this isn't, this isn't going to get solved. This is crazy. And this morning, as I studied to prepare today, this, this wasn't in here this week. God just touched my heart. He said, Stuart, you know, what other hope is there? Jesus is the only hope for the world. No matter how far away from, they, from me they are or how close to me they think they are, the reality of it is the darkness in the world can only be solved by the light of the world. The only way to poke holes in the darkness is for Christ to come. And he can only come as God has determined through what? Us. So the question then is asked, who will risk their own lives in order to see the lives of multitudes saved? Because that's what we're talking about. Missionary after missionary, apostle after apostle have had to lay their own lives down. But Jesus used that sacrifice, that martyrdom, to touch the lives of millions over time. I'm convinced that God is certainly calling someone, but maybe everyone, to do, just, to do just that. What did Jesus say? If you want to have life, you better lose it. What did he mean? You need to give your life back to me. Make it an offering to me. I'm a good father. I'm going to look out for you. But I know what you don't know. I care about things you don't understand. My ways are higher than your ways. Just like he did with Jonah. Jonah. He calls people to their enemies. How are we going to respond when God loves our enemies? And listen, he loves them. He loves them the same as he loves you. And he doesn't care how we feel about it. In reality, God's whole mission through Christ is to teach us how to get above and beyond our emotions and trust him by faith. If you're comfortable, you're not where God would have you. Am I saying anything that isn't true today? Well, of course I'm not. Let's break a... Let's bring a little levity. Jonah's kind of like the woman who testified to the transformation in her life resulting from her personal relationship with Jesus. She said, you know what? I'm so glad I found Jesus. I used to have this uncle that I said, you know what? If he died, I wouldn't even go to his funeral. But praise the Lord for Jesus because here's what I can say now. If he did happen to die, I'd be happy to go to his funeral at any time. Somebody has a sense of humor in here. You want to see something really ironic? Anybody know what the cuneiform, right? Hieroglyphic cuneiform, the, the ancient language uh, image for Nineveh is? <clears throat> it's a fish within a house. What's ironic about that? Who did God send to them? A man within a fish. God sent a man within a fish 
to the city that identified itself as a fish within a house. Some would tell you that that cuneiform image was a direct result of Jonah and his influence there. That's debatable. It's kind of cool to think that that'd be true, though. So we left off with Jonah 3.10 last week that says this, Then God saw their action. Whose actions? Nineveh's. This bloodthirsty enemy of God's people. He saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways, so God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. ISIS repented, and God forgave them of all their sin. And his message to us would be, vengeance is mine. They're now my children, and all that they've ever done has been forgiven, just like all that we've done has been forgiven. Now, Jonah had to absorb that. He had to digest that, right? Jonah's five-word sermon, remember? My man went in there and preached five words, and they were at the buffet. Knocked it out, right? Five words, didn't mention God, didn't mention Jesus, didn't mention repentance, hope, grace, anything of that. He said, look, you got 40 days and God's going to destroy you. They said, all right, let's get saved. Boy, I wish it was that easy today. Huh? We'd see revival coming out our ears, wouldn't we? But you know what happened? They repented. I might, you might want to write this down. When the people of God, when the people turned from their evil, when the people of Nineveh turned from their evil, when they what? What does it mean to turn from your evil? They repented. When the people repented, turned from their evil, God relented, which that word has been translated more times in the, in the Bible than, than, than any other word as evil. God relented from what he was going to do to them. When they turned from their evil, God turned from the evil he was going to do to them. And to Jonah, that was absolutely evil. You tracking with what I'm saying? When people turn from their evil, God turns from the evil he was going to do to them. Where, what happens to all sin in the end? Somebody tell me. Nobody knows? Maybe we need to just stop and preach Jesus real quick. What happens to all evil when it's all said and done? What does God do to it all? He judges it all. All evil is judged. The gracious is, uh, can, can stand before God and Jesus says, no, their evil was judged in me, but it's been judged. My sin was judged on the cross in Jesus Christ. His perfect sacrifice covered my sin, my debt, what I owed. I was an evil enemy of God until Jesus rescued me from myself. So were you. And when I turned from my evil, God turned from the judgment he had planned for me. And you know what's beautiful about all this? He didn't have that evil plan for me in the first place. I, our people chose that evil. That was for the demons. That was for the devil. But our people chose sin, and that's where the judgment came in. If we wouldn't have messed up, our whole life would be different today, wouldn't it? But guess what the first word to follow that phrase is? But. But the first word to follow that is but. One word's going to reveal to us the entire contrast between God's compassion and Jonah's response to it. You should be in Jonah chapter 4. If you don't mind turning there quickly. Jonah chapter 4. Let's read the first three verses together. God relented of the evil he was going to do, but... Jonah was greatly displeased, and he became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarsus in the first place. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. Let's look at Jonah's prejudice just for a second. Call it patriotism. Call it whatever you want to. But that's the way I see it. Here we have God's compassion, right? And what did Jonah see God's compassion as? He saw it as a great evil. He was displeased with it. It ticked him off. He saw that God was slow to anger. He lost his temper with God. He got hot. He's furious. 
when he should have been discipling people that met Jesus and helped them to learn how to be more and in, in practice what they became in position, he disobeyed again. What did he do? And he's yelling at God. You catch the tone? He's, he's yelling at God for his nature. He says, please, Lord, please. And he says, you know what? I knew it. I knew it. I knew this would happen. That's why I ran in the first place. I knew you were merciful, God. I knew you were a compassionate, gracious God. I knew you were a patient God. I knew you were a, ritual, a richly faithful, loving God. If the, if, here's the thing. I want these graces for me, but I don't want them for them. I want you to treat me like that, but don't treat them like that. You see it? And then he says this. Look at me for a second. He says, look, if you won't kill, if you won't kill them, kill me. It's better to die than know that they're living. I'd rather be dead than know that, that you, you let them live. Right? Now let's look how God responds. Verse 4, the Lord asked, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry with me? Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Ouch. Right? What's God's tone with this petulant prophet? If he's angry, it doesn't sound like it to me. Does it sound like he's angry to you? Sounds like he's trying to teach his son a lesson. It's not an easy lesson. It's a tough lesson. We all have tough lessons to learn, but it sounds to me like that's just what God is trying to do. He says, look, what are you angry about? Do you have a right to be angry? Some translations say this. This is kind of cool. He says, look, is anything good coming from your anger? Is anything good coming from his anger? In essence, God is saying, look, should I ignore my nature and destroy them just to please you? Verse 5, Jonah left the city and sat down east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. Mm. Again, we've said it before, let's say it again. That joker's brave, right? He's brave. Maybe he's stupid. Maybe let's just say he's stupid. He's stupid brave. That, that, that's the boy that grows up to be evil Knievel right there. You like that? Watch this. You know that boy. I kind of was that boy, right? But here's what he did. He walked off from the face of God again. God asked him a question. He doesn't even answer God. Oh, parents, daddies. Woo. What makes you matter than to talk to that youngin and have them to walk off and not answer you? Oh, it's on then, ain't it? Walked off. Didn't say nothing. Woo. Then he went out and made himself a shelter. I picture a lean-to. Lean Y'all know what a lean-to is, right? What's a lean-to? Get this piece and this piece, you lean the two together. Made himself a shelter, right? He sat down and he did what? He sulked. And then he watched the city to see what God's response was going to be. He's still withholding hope that God's going to destroy these people. Now think about this. He's just been fussing about God's compassion, fussing about God's nature. Now does he think God's going to change his mind just to suit him? Well, that's kind of how selfish people think. But he should have known better, ain't it? You might want to write this down. The longer God let them live, them, the matter he got. We've looked a lot over this book study, and we've seen that God has power over nature, doesn't he? Natural appointment over natural appointment. Let's look at the next one. This, this is really funny. I, I hope you see the humor in it like I did. Then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up to provide shade over Jonah's head to ease his discomfort. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. <laughs> okay, I'll, I can see maybe you don't see the humor in it that I do. God appointed, assigned what? He assigned a plant to grow up overnight over Jonah's head to shade him. That was some kind of plant. We need, we, we need to figure out how to do that. But it eased his discomfort. Now, look at the irony. He's hot-headed on the inside. This plant cooled his head on the outside. Let me ask you this. He must not have been a very good shelter builder. Right? He must have built a really bad lean-to. 
Because why does he need a, you know, you know what I'm saying? I think I could create something to keep the sun off my head. But God had to provide a plant. You might want to write this down too. God provides this plant. He finds great pleasure, although he has extraordinary displeasure with the God who made it. How often do we get tickled to tickle pink and pleased with the things that God does for us while all the while we're actually in our nature displeased with him even though we never say it out loud? We just say it with our actions or our lack thereof. He's sideways with God, but he loves what God gives him. Boy, that sounds like us sometimes, doesn't it? He enjoyed its shade. Life was looking up. Then we get God's seventh, sixth, God's sixth natural appointment. It keeps getting funnier. Then the Lord, uh, seven. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm. The worm attacked the plant and it withered. Okay, stay with me. I know it's Father's Day. I know we want to get out here and go eat chicken wings or whatever, but this is good stuff, right? Okay, he's out there pouting. He's sideways. He builds a lean-to. The lean tooth. sorry. The sun's shining on his head. He's boiling like an egg out there, like this week. So God puts a plant out there and it lets him shade him. He's tickled. And then overnight, while it's cool, he wakes up. There's a worm that comes and eats the plant. He's dead when he wakes up. That's funny. That's funny. I don't care who you are right there. That worm was an assignment, an appointment from God. He's going to teach Jonah one way or the other. The God-appointed plant withered to the God-appointed worm. There's a certain amount of evidence, Americans, that God has appointed a worm to eat the plant he provided to put the shade on our heads. And I hate to say it like this because it hurts me to do so, but I think we kind of got it coming. Let's just pray that we repent and turn from the evil that we're doing so God can turn from the evil he's doing to us. Look at verse 8. So the, All right, let's make this. Stay with me now. He builds his lean-to. You could have done a high dive off his lower lip, right? And God puts a plant over his head, gives him some shade just long enough for him to get used to it, and the worm eats it. And then what? Another natural appointment. Look at verse 8. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. You ever been outside when it was hot, like Africa hot? You know what I mean? And then that hot wind blows through too? That's a hot that'll take your breath, ain't it? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ride a motorcycle? There's certain days when you get on a motorcycle, the wind ain't cooler. It just makes you even hotter, right? This is, the, this is what God did. As the sun rose, God appointed a sign, what? A blazing east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head. You know what I think God's doing? Hey, son, I'm going to withdraw all my blessings, and I'm going to let you remember what it was like to be lost again. You want these people to die, I'm going to show you a little bit of what hell would be like. What's that sign that all the folks like to put on their church sign? You think this is hot, right? What's Jonah's response? Let's keep reading. The sun beat down so much on Jonah's head that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. What's Jonah's response? He almost fainted. He wanted to die, and then he says this again. Don't miss this. He says, look, it's better for me to die than to live while God lets them live. It's all about them. If they live in, I'd rather be dead. I don't want to live in a world with them in it. So look at verse 9. God's still trying to teach his son. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, he replied. It's right. I'm angry enough to die. So we have God's second inquiry, right? Just like his first one. He says, look, what are you angry about now? Is it the plant? Do you have a right to be angry about that plant? Here's what he's saying. Jonah, look, son, is anything good coming from your anger? Is anything good coming from your behavior right now? Is this going to turn out good in any Wait, and you know what Jonah says? Yes, it's right for me to be angry. I'm so angry that I'd rather die than live. And here's the good that's going to come out of my anger. The good that will come out of my anger is I will be dead and I won't have to live in a world with them in it. You got to hate somebody right regular to say that, ain't it? 
Let's look at the moral of the story, verse 10 and 11. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. Should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which, was, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left? And then here's the irony again. Here's the humor. As well as many animals. You see it? I ain't, I ain't asking you if it's easy. I'm asking you if you see it. You see God in this? Here's the moral of the story. He says, look, your feelings can change so much about a plant you didn't even grow. It was here today, gone tomorrow. You're not the gardener. And then God says, look, your sideways about a plant should not care for 120,000 people. And if you know anything about the biblical record, they only list what? Sorry, ladies. What do they list? Sorry, children. Men. Women were kind of second-class citizens in that part of the world. Sometimes they still are. I hate that for y'all, but at least it ain't me. Just kidding. He says, look, you're sideways about a plant. You want me to destroy 120,000 people. Son, have you thought this through? And here's what I read until he says, look, you didn't grow the plant. You're not the gardener. Jonah, look, son, I am the gardener. I am the gardener, and the fields are white to harvest. Right? The fields are white to harvest. He ain't leaving Jonah any wiggle room at all. They can't even distinguish. They don't even know right from left, which is in, in essence what he's saying. Look, you want me to destroy a bunch of people that don't even know right from wrong. Yeah, they've been evil. They've done terrible things. They don't know me. If it weren't for me, you're liable to be one of them. Them, 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 them. Have you ever considered what you might be capable of if Jesus didn't live in you? I've thought about it because I know how much really bad things I've done with Jesus living in me. Well, we'd be, to be careful looking down our nose at them. There before the grace of God, go us. And then he says this. There's 120,000 people, not to mention their animals. Okay, is that just something he added in there to, 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 to make you go like this? Or is there, a, is there some reason behind this? Okay, track with me. God says, look, you're mad about a plant. Do you even care about animals? Because what I've got here is 120,000 plus people. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase. Here's what I think God is saying. Why can't I change the way I feel about people the way you change the way you feel about a stupid plant? Why can't I change the way I feel about this multitude of people like you've changed your impression of a plant that grew up overnight. How great a plant can it be if it grew up overnight? We're not talking an oak tree. You so desperately want these people dead now. Any more life for them is too much life for you. And then I get the impression that God's saying that to them and this to him. And I want him to say it to us today. Let me look at me for a second. Do you know how precious life is? Do you? Have you sat back and thought about how precious it is that God gives us life? He doesn't have to do that. Every day we wake up is a good day because God's allowed us to live another day in service of him. Do we take that for granted? Here's what I think he's saying to Jonah metaphorically. Jonah liked to pray the Psalms earlier. Remember that? Let me read a couple of things for you. David said this, God, you end their lives. They sleep. They are like grass that grows in the morning. In the morning it sprouts and grows. By evening it withers and dries up. What's that talking about? People. How brief life is. You know what I think Jonah was thinking about? His plant. God says, you're sideways about this plant. And he reminds him, People are like grass. Your life is brief. Life is so valuable and it's so brief. It comes up today and it's gone tomorrow. It withers 
just like your plant did. Listen to what Isaiah said. A voice was saying, cry out. Warn people, talk to people, spread the gospel. And then another voice said, why should I cry out? And he says, because all humanity is as grass. And all its goodness is like a flower of the field. The grass withers. The flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Indeed, the people are grass. The grass withers. The flowers fade. But the word of God remains forever. That'll preach. Now, if God said that to you, what do you think? I think I'd repent, don't you? I said, okay, you got me. You got me. You got me. Jonah looked at God's nature and he saw it as evil. You get that right. Everything in God's nature that Jonah saw as evil, God used to reveal the prophet's own evil to him. God will show us who we are. Right now we look in a glass darkly, but if you look in the glass, God will show you where you're really at. Every day, imagine life as a mirror, and the Holy Spirit of God is that mirror. Every day we should look into the mirror of our lives and find ourselves to be a little bit more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. Right? God is gracious. He longs for, favors everyone. Look, folks. Jonah died for those people, gentlemen, ladies, whatever, who are blowing up people, cutting off their heads, doing these dastardly things, just like he died for you. He did. You don't have to like it. How do you think they would respond if they... If the shoe was on the other foot. So wait a minute, God. You want me to go to those reprobate Americans? Why would you ever save them? Don't you know who they are, what they really are like? God is gracious. Jonah was poisoned by hate. God's compassionate. He has ten tender, affectionate care for everyone to his core. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We are to love our enemies because God loves our enemies. He is compassionate to our enemies. <clears throat> Jonah had no compassion. God is slow to anger. He turns from anger. He hates to punish us. God's patient. God is slow to anger. Jonah turned to. Jonah turned in anger. God is abounding in love, loyal love, faithful love, covenant faithfulness. God always does what he promises you he's going to do. Jonah hated. God relents from sending calamity. And Jonah longed to see it. Jonah hated them so much, he couldn't bear to see them embrace God. That's what he said. There's the... Jonah hated them so much, he didn't want to see them meet God. Wow! He wanted them to die in this life and suffer in hell in the next. That's what he wanted. Mm. Let me ask you, what other hope for the world is there? When we look at the world and we see the evil, we see the destruction, we see the, this is terrible stuff that's happening, y'all. Don't hear what I'm not saying. This is absolutely dastardly darkness from the devil. There you go. How you like that alliteration? Pull that one right out of the air right quick. The world is getting so desperately wicked and depraved. I fear for, your, for, for our children, but I really fear for our grandchildren. What kind of world are they going to grow up in if nothing changes? All right, look at me. We all got a them. You got one, dadgummit. You do. You may not admit it to me, but God knows it, and deep down I hope you know it. When you think about them, that enemy, that person that you do not want to see meet Jesus, think about it like this. All right, what other hope for the world is there? You want to just keep on passing this hate down to your children and their children and let them keep right on fighting and shooting and killing one another? What other hope for the world is there if it's not Jesus? Turn the cat around. Who will risk their own lives to love their enemies because you know that in the end, God will use that to save 
multitudes of people. God is calling someone, certainly. God may be calling everyone, certainly, to do just that. Just like he did Jonah. How many of you have ever heard of J. Vernon McGee? J. Vernon, J. Vernon McGee is one of the most prolific preachers of all time. He revolutionized radio preaching. He was really the first person to do it. He died in the 80s. He's still on the air today. You should read him or check him out when you get a chance. Here's what he says. <clears throat> and it's ironic because he was a Presbyterian, which most of them are Calvinistic. But here's, here's what he says. God will never interfere with your free will. He's not going to force you on any issue whatsoever, for you are a free moral agent. God has actually moved heaven and hell and has come by way of a cross to knock at your heart's door. But my friend, he will not come any further until that door is opened. And it must be open from the inside. He will never crash the door of your heart. He will never push it in. He will never come in uninvited. So the question is this, is he invited in now? Is God invited into your heart now? Will he enter your heart now if you withhold his love from your enemies? What's God going to have to appoint to get our attention? Is it going to have to be a, a storm, a raging sea, a sea monster, a shade tree, a destructive worm, a blazing sun, a scorching wind? What's God going to have to send to get our attention and so that we will learn this? Look, folks. God's world is bigger than our world, and everyone matters to him. You may want to write this down, too. God's love is bigger than his wrath. It's a good thing, too, because we got some wrath coming, all of us. We're all dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking sinners, every one of us. Ain't none of us better than nobody else, including them. God accepts repentance from the worst of sinners. No matter how bad someone is, he will forgive them and accept their repentance and he will save them. The largest percentage of the Bible is written by murderers. And one of those gentlemen wasn't just a murderer, he was intentionally killing Christians. And God forgave him. Jesus Christ died for Adolf Hitler just like he died for you. That person you hate, those people, them, you better get your mind around the fact that God loves them. And he's waiting to love them through you. Because God accepts repentance from the very worst of sinners. And then add this, even us.